So it is my great pleasure to welcome those of you who are new to this room uh, to the 25th anniversary meeting of the Cognitive Neuroscience Society and to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker. For those of you who have perused the CNS website, you may have come across this intriguing sentence. The scientific field of cognitive neuroscience received its name in the late 1970s in the back seat of a New York City taxi. Well, today's keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Gazaniga, was one of those passengers and has been lauded father of cognitive neuroscience. He has spent his remarkable career trying to understand how the human brain gives rise to the human experience. He is therefore someone who simultaneously needs no introduction and who also could never be given an introduction sufficiently long to do justice to his impact. Mike has authored many of the seminal papers in our field. Here are some numbers that will be truly awe-inspiring. His work has been cited over 45,000 times, with 10,000 of those citations coming in just the past five years. Many of his individual papers have been cited hundreds and even thousands of times, ranging from his seminal 1967 paper on the split brain in man to his 2000 paper in brain asking the question, does the corpus callosum enable the human condition? His papers on the ethical brain and the social brain ushered in discussion of those topics years before they became prominent domains of study within the field of human neuroscience. He has edited the books that have gotten many of us excited about this field of study in the first place and that serve as our compass, the Cognitive Neurosciences series from MIT Press. If you haven't read those foundational texts, especially for the trainees in the room, I would really encourage you to do so. They're a remarkable overview of the seminal findings and the most exciting discoveries in our field. Through his many books that he's written, he has also ensured that those exciting discoveries and seminal findings are communicated clearly to the general public, making sure that everyone understands the importance of what we're, we're discovering. It is not hyperbole, I don't think, to suggest that many of us would not be in these seats today were it not either directly or indirectly for the mentorship, training, and inspiration that Mike has provided. It's hard to trace an academic lineage in this field that does not find its roots intertwined with Mike's. In addition to his inspiring and groundbreaking research, he has invested tremendous time in developing infrastructure for training the next generation of cognitive neuroscientists, and so many of us in this room have him to be thankful for. Critically for all of us in this room, he has worked passionately to ensure that this conference is one where trainees feel supported and inspired to delve further into the neural mechanisms that support the human experience. I know I certainly appreciated that focus nearly 20 years ago when I attended my first meeting as a graduate student, and I expect we all continue to appreciate that focus when we see the outstanding research that trainees are presenting at this conference, as was on full display in this afternoon's Data Blitz sessions and poster session. In addition to being a founder of this society, Michael Gazaniga is director of the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind at UCSB, president of the Cognitive Neuroscience Institute, founding director of the MacArthur Foundation's Law and Neuroscience Project, founding director of the Summer Institute in Cognitive Neuroscience, and founding editor of the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Among his accolades, which are far too long for me to list here if I give him any time for his own talk, he's been elected to the Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the National Academy of Sciences. If you're interested in learning more about his remarkable career, I would highly recommend that you read his 2015 book, Tales from Both Sides of the Brain, A Life in Neuroscience. It's really a seamless blend of autobiography and scientific review, and it's a great read. He also has a new book out, and I believe there might actually still be some copies uh, for you to grab, called The Consciousness Instinct, Unraveling the Mystery of How the Brain Makes the Mind. Um, I'm really excited to read my copy and to get a sneak peek at some of its theses this afternoon. So at this anniversary meeting, there really is no one more fitting for this keynote address than Michael Gazaniga. His vision for what the field of cognitive neuroscience could become drew many of us to this field of study, and he continues to inspire future generations. He is uniquely able to reflect back on the history of this field and how we have gotten to where we are now, and if the past is any predictor of the future, and of course our memory systems hope that it is, he is also well-suited to look ahead at what insights this field can provide over the next quarter century. It is therefore a particular honor to introduce Michael Gazaniga at this public lecture, and I hope that you'll join me in giving him a warm welcome to the podium. Well, thank, thank you, Liz, for that marvelous introduction. I, some of my family's here. I hope they heard it. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm really very honored to be here 
uh, at the invitation of uh, the society, and I, I, I deeply appreciate it. Uh, my appreciation is shown by the fact that, uh, that my new book uh, is out there, and my gift to you is to take a copy. And if you don't like it, give it to your graduate students or whoever you know, might, might be there. I thought before we get into the uh, uh, subject of consciousness, I did want to take five minutes or so <laughs> and review the, 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 briefly the history of this great society. You just saw evidence of it uh, in the preceding section where we've uh, kept evolving and now we have free and open discussions about the extremely important topics. The, uh, the first, uh, you know what? I think they loaded the wrong one. One second. Hold on, hold the phone here. I got it. I got it. I got it. Well, there we go. We got the right one. That's still the same thing. That's the uh, <laughs> that's the Rockefeller University bar. And where did this all get started? Well. Rockefeller is a great university, as you know, with many famous professors, and no more famous than this man, George Miller. And uh, <clears throat> George and I used to meet there after work. I was across the street at Cornell. And Rockefeller Bar has a way of motivating its faculty by putting little signs around. And as you were about to order your drink, there was this cartoon hung on the wall, which is, yeah, he invented fire, but what's he done lately? And that sort of keeps you on your toes. And so George and I started talking about this idea of cognitive neuroscience. <clears throat> and this is really a story about his generosity and his vision, because he immediately uh, in incorporated the idea into his thinking, even though he at the time was, was a cognitive scientist. And we immediately arranged to have Many of the leaders of cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive psychology at the time, neuropsychology, it was called all kinds of things, uh, come through Rockefeller, and uh, talking to them, we cultivated uh, the field, uh, uh, and through uh, growth of that, uh, convinced uh, other foundations, McDonald Foundation, to launch this new, new field. And you can see your favorite uh, neuro, neuropsychologists there, Steve Hilliard, Brenda Milner, Sue Cork, and Endel Tolving, Ann Treisman, Alfonso Karamasa, Morton Mishkin, Mike Posner, Pat Golden, Marquise, Emilio Beatsy, Floyd Bloom, Steve Pinker, Helen Neville, David Premack, and Roger Shepard. We all, they all came to New York enthusiastically to uh, help us kick this thing off. And I also want to <coughs> point out to you that, uh, <coughs> that I have a cough. And uh, so if you see me seize up, just give me a second. And I'll wet my whistle. And that'll work. Uh, <clears throat> but in the, in the explore, exploration of new ideas, I want to emphasize the role of play. And part of that early time, we used to hold these little meetings. And for those of you who hold meetings, let me give you a piece of advice. Pick a wonderful place where there's no cell phone activity take 10 people and stay there a week. And that's what we did. <clears throat> and we did it innumerable times. And ideas of memory, language, and all the rest of it were cross-fertilized. This particular one here was when Francis Crick became interested in neuroscience and we went off to Morea. And it wasn't that you didn't have a bunch of people only interested in memory. You had a cross-pollinization. There was Leon Fessinger, Duncan Luce. What are they doing there? Well, they're smart and they all take uh, to having lively discussions. And of course, lot, lots of things were going on uh, in those uh, late 70s and 80s. And this landmark paper, some of the derivatives of which we just heard this wonderful discussion by uh, Steve Peterson and Mike Posner and <clears throat> Mark Rakel and 
and, and uh, uh, Peter Fox, <coughs> they were, <coughs> excuse me, they really launched a thousand ships when brain imaging came in and demonstrated to the world that there could be a human neurobiology of normal cognitive processes. And their papers really set the stage for what has been 25 years of spectacular work. Uh, so spectacular that now there are discussions of where it goes, how to interpret it, and all the rest. All healthy, all positive. And then, of course, there was uh, the founding of the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Uh, <clears throat> that is the uh, house uh, uh, my wife and I lived in, who, of course, is, in fact, uh, Charlotte Smiley, the managing editor, who, was st who started the journal and to this day remains as a managing editor under the new leadership of Mark Desposito, who's done just a fantastic job. And all of this was in the brew while we said we got to have a society. And it was that simple. And <clears throat> we started in San Francisco uh, in 1993. And as you can see from that picture, the, actually the keynote speaker then that, that day was uh, uh, Steve Pinker. And uh, we were off and running. And now, as you know, <laughs> it's a full form society and the whole operation is run by the members themselves and it's really just terrific. So thank you to all of them and thank you uh, for having me. <laughs> so this little problem. <laughs> the British have a thing about this problem. This famous quote, <clears throat> consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written about it. <laughs> Stuart Sutherland said that, a distinguished experimental psychologist. But it goes deeper than that. <clears throat> a few years back, I was on my way to Oxford for a, a convoluted brain uh, meeting. And I'm at the uh, passport control. and. Uh, the agent says, so what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a professor. Well, what in? And I said, well, neuroscience. He goes, ah, looking at my passport now. Neuroscience. Left brain, right brain? <laughs> and I said, because he, he was taking a little too long, you know. I said, well, yeah, matter of fact. <laughs> I kind of tried to cozy up to him a little bit, and I said, I had something to do with that, actually. <laughs> Stamps my passport, hands it back to me, and says, where are you going? I said, well, to Oxford for a meeting on consciousness. It doesn't quite... <laughs> Looks at me and says, have you ever thought about quitting while you're ahead? <laughs> so they, they're on to it. It's a tough problem. Well, we know there are lots of people worrying about it. <clears throat> and we can frame it that some people like John Searle of Berkeley think that it is a, there's this thing called qualia, this, this consciousness itself can be studied, it's something in the brain, you're gonna find it, you're gonna find the mechanism of it. Where you think uh, someone like Dan Dennett, of course thinks it's certainly interesting, but it's an illusion. Uh, it's, it's just like magic, there's things in there working along and then this thing happens. And illusions are powerful events, as we all know. Even though we know these two tabletops are the same, and we cognitively understand it, and all that, uh, we're fooled every time. And that's sort of his idea about uh, how to think about consciousness. We're gonna find out <coughs> brain mechanisms, but are we gonna be pleased because maybe the rest of it is in the illusionary category. So what I wanna do today <coughs> is tell you about my recent journey into this topic, <coughs> and I'll give you a quick, uh, 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 breakneck review of the matter from the uh, history of philosophy in the last 2,500 years, 
then tell you a little bit about the current structural models, and then finally try to close with a couple of new ideas that are generated from uh, fields that we know are, normally don't uh, read. So 2,500 years of human Western thought in five minutes. How's that? The Egyptians uh, thought there was really no difference between nature and the human. There was all, we were all part of the same system. And then the big idea of the Greeks that actually uh, the mind was generated by the biologic system uh, and the brain. And uh, then uh, we went, go into the uh, 14, from then, then forward, we, we go forward to almost 1500, where a lot of people thought that the fact that the mind was generated by the brain, but upon death, <coughs> the soul uh, took off, survived, it was immortal. And then finally, <coughs> excuse me, um, Descartes, with the big discovery, of course, that uh, in fact, uh, the mentalism and dualism was the way to think about it. The mind was uh, actually not part of the brain. So uh, through this, these three ideas, that the mind is part of the brain, that the mind is part of the brain, but the soul leaves, and then the mind, and the mind is separate from the brain. These three ideas are basically what our species has come up with over the last 2,500 years. And we take you to the modern times, and I'll stop, tell about this in a minute, uh, where uh, in, in the modern articulation of what we think about it, in fact, Sperry and Crick and Mackay and Eccles the three modern neuroscientists broke their opinion, their, their opinions broke down along those same uh, fault lines. So the Egyptians. The Egyptians, <coughs> excuse me for my voice, I'm sorry, feel, but then, what can I do? Uh, the Egyptians uh, believe that the, the, the nature and the world were one and the Nile River had thoughts just like they did. And when she went on a flood, she was, when it flooded, she was, she was mad. And it wasn't because there was a brain at the other end. So it went from a sort of thou understanding of the world to an it. And this was pointed out by uh, uh, Henrietta and Henry Frankfurt in their marvelous book. And uh, it, the Greeks came along and, and made this fantastic idea. No, it's not a, it's not a thou. It's an it, there's a third party, we can understand it. The universe is an intelligible whole that a single order underlines the chaos of our perceptions. And just think what, a, what an enormous idea it is and how that redirected the destiny of, of the human condition. And <laughs> their disciples uh, uh, decided to look at this thing called the human body and, the, and some Greeks went to Egypt, where you could dissect uh, bodies, and uh, Herophilus and Herostratus are considered sort of the fathers of modern neuroscience, and they came up and they found the ventricles, and they had this idea that <clears throat> spirits may flow through the hollow nerves. Eh, not quite right, but uh, pretty good given the time that there was no context at all. And that stood kind of there for four or five hundred years, Till Galen came along, and while he couldn't dissect because you couldn't dissect in, in, in Rome, uh, he, he was allowed to use uh, gladiator bodies and, um, and baboons to do his dissection. And of course, he sets things uh, on a different course. He put the rational processes in the brain, the appetitive processes in the heart, I mean, in the liver and the spiritual in the heart. And he also, of course, did all the famous things of the arterial venous flow and a million other things. A true genius uh, and, and paved the way. Little did he think that that view of what was going on would stick around for 1,400 years. 1,400 years. We're worried about our three-year grant renewal. You know, I mean, none of us have the slightest belief that anything we're saying here is going to last for 1,400 years. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, so then Vesalius comes along, he gets the anatomy right, and he basically puts everything in the brain. 
he left himself a little bit open on the spiritual question because he didn't want to uh, lose his skin, as they say. Uh, and and it took us. It, it took. But the, there was a churning force of people trying to bring bring a physical basis to this whole idea of the of conscious experience of mind and, and spirit. And uh, over in in France, um, there was kind of a coffee house atmosphere, and Marcel Marsan uh, was uh, hosted a, a a group a salon, uh, and there was it was quite a salon. Uh, uh, he, he, of course, was a defender of Galileo, a fellow mathematician, a theologian, a philosopher, actually a musical theorist. And he believed church had to accept the universe was mechanistic. And he said God could rule a universe that followed natural rules. What's wrong with that? Uh, but that was, of course, uh, heretical uh, to some extent. But at that same uh, uh, coffee house was <coughs> Pierre Gassandi, who came up with the idea of a molecule. He was a, an, uh, an atomist. Uh, he also was a French philosopher, a mathematician, scientist, priest. Everything is made out of atoms, which joined into molecules. Did not find this belief her heretical either, just like Marsan. And <clears throat> God made atoms too, but no atoms of any com combination could reflect on themselves. Therefore, human must have another soul, a rational soul that was immaterial. Well, guess who else was at that same salon? Rene Descartes. Can you imagine? I mean, that's a bar. <laughs> <clears throat> Thomas Hobbes was there. We'll get to in a second. They're all working this stuff out. And Descartes, of course, <clears throat> simply had, I'm thinking and have no doubt about it. That's indubitable. I'm questionable. Also, I know I'm wrong. I, also, I am not wrong. I am thinking it is infallible. I think, therefore, I am. <coughs> and out of that, he derives his notion of dualism. But he was a true biologist. He believed in mechanism and biology in the body, as you know. And so while he liked, he liked the uh, uh, Vakasson's duck, uh, he believed that this irrational mind that he constructed and said it must be up there, it makes contact in the brain, as we all know, uh, and the pineal gland, because that was the only undivided structure uh, in the brain. So he also, I have to point out, his, his, his notion of, of brain as a machine came directly uh, from Descartes. So uh, Hobbes, as I said, was at that same salon and uh, he didn't, he said no to this dualism, no to souls, didn't buy any of it, and basically, as I like to put it, thought like an engineer about the mind and brain. And he then had a fr fruitful life meeting uh, other anatomists, and that's a long, all this stuff, I should say, by the way, is fascinating and it has tentacles with other people and intriguing subplots, and every one of these slides I'm flying by here scholars spend their lives on <clears throat> working out all the intricacies. So each one is rich. And then the philosopher that I think um, we look back on as really sort of setting the stage for, for the present is David Hume, where he said no to dualism, no to axioms, and yes to Newton, and let's establish the science of man and, and get this done. And, and Hume, to my way of thinking, said something that basically is what I'm going to say to you today. <laughs> the mind is kind of a theater where several perceptions successfully make their appearance, pass, repass, slide away, and mingle in the infant variety of postures and situations. And that is, uh, hold that, just let that regurgitate, regurgitate and hold it, not, not regurgitate, uh, you know what I mean. Uh, and, and he, but he says, in, in each moment of time, there's something happening, and that's the key idea. And then over, in, of course, in, in, in Germany and Vienna, uh, people were accepting the, the brain <clears throat> had something to do with the mind and trying to go into the mechanisms of the brain. And all that's going on. 
And I'm just going to shoot forward to this meeting in 1962. <laughs> as, as you know, or you should know, <clears throat> the Vatican has an Academy of Science. It's uh, actually run by um, uh, non-clerics. And uh, in 1962, they held a famous meeting where <clears throat> the thought was it was time for them to look at this consciousness thing from a neuroscience point of view. And so they held a meeting entitled Brain and Conscious Experience. <clears throat> and these were the three players that we're going to uh, identify because uh, it's so important to the, the, the question. <clears throat> There's, there was <clears throat> the, the conference organizer, Sir John Eccles, Nobel laureate, person that figured out how the synapse uh, worked to a large extent, uh, and a Catholic uh, at the time. And he, nonetheless, was a dualist, okay? So go figure. Uh, the Don Mackay was a British neuroscientist, uh, a distinguished uh, physicist gone into information theory and all the rest of it. And uh, he really had the engineering view, but he believed upon death that there was an immortality of the soul. And then my mentor, Roger Sperry, who had the position that the brain generated the mind, uh, but that there were emergent properties that then controlled the lower processes uh, in the brain. So there they are. Those are the three ideas that uh, the modern neuroscientists came up with. Uh, Eccles even drew it out. He didn't believe the mind hit the brain at the pineal gland. He thought it was in the supplementary motor area on the left side. Well, that's pretty specific. <laughs> uh, Sperry, uh, my, my mentor, the way he put it, a molecule is the master of inner atoms and, and electrons. Its electrical, electrons are hauled and forced about in chemical interactions by the overall configurational properties of the whole molecule. Similarly, when it comes to brains, remember always that the simpler forces and laws, though still present and operating, have all been superseded in brain dynamics by the configurational properties of higher level mechanism. So that was his way of, of capturing the problem. And I'm having a little fun with this. Mackay, <laughs> you see the spirit leaving there? They, they captured that. And uh, this was from uh, uh, some magazine I saw at the market. So those are the three positions. And uh, and of course, that's 1962. We're 50 years out from 1962. We've had this vast expanse of knowledge, some of which we just were uh, 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 reviewed for us. And uh, I would say that there are many cognitive models that kind of think there's a system in the brain, and they talk about the big systems and how they interact in order to have a conscious moment. And of course, the neuroscientists have got a gazillion models about what what patterns, what lobes, what circuits have to be involved in order for a conscious experience. And there are, of course, many, many terrific scientists working on it, uh, have worked on it. <laughs> Francis Crick, uh, 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 Stan DeHane, Julia Tononi, Jerry Edelman, Bernard Bars, Bars and Christoph uh, Koch. And they're all, they all have their models, and they all, I would say, involve very much the notion of the systems and circuits and we're going to figure out this circuit, we're going to figure out how this thing you and I enjoy every moment of conscious experience works. They're working on that mechanism. And so I would say <coughs> they, they were relying though on what I would call large centralized circuits. And I have a different hunch and I'm going to say that we are full of specialized systems and circuits and that uh, uh, if we're going to understand this problem of consciousness, we're going to have to understand how the circuits that enable particular skills that we have, how those circuits are enabled for that conscious moment. And what I'm going to suggest is that, in fact, <laughs> what consciousness is, is a bubbling up of different specialized systems at a moment in time. And through time, 
it appears as a stream of conscious experience. Okay, that's a big statement, uh, and it's time to see if there, why, why would anybody say that? Uh, so let me try, try to tell you. And this allows me to say that the, I, I, I continue to think that the, the most riveting moment in neuroscience is when you can see a split brain patient reveal to you that they have two mental systems, each with its own set of controls. And uh, we've been studying uh, this for a long time, as you know. And so to the question, can consciousness be, consciousness be divided? The answer to us, it clearly is, yes, it can. So, wow, you know, consciousness over here, right? Consciousness over there, right? And how can, you, maybe it's multiple places. And that's what we want to examine. So, in a moment for the classic neuropsychologist, I thought I'd show this short clip of my colleague <laughs> several years ago, <clears throat> testing case VP, I think it was about two or three months after surgery. And you can see for yourself the stunning sort of uh, uh, a revelation of what it's like. So he's just doing the standard uh, neurologic exam, what do you see, how many fingers, and so forth. And I think it's self-explanatory. Show me with your right hand what you see. Okay. Put it down, relax. Show me with your left hand what you see. Fine. Good. Okay, keep looking right at my nose. Did you see that? You get it? Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Look right at my nose. Okay. Show me with your... Do you see anything now? You know. Any finger? Any fingers? No. Well, okay. they're like this. Okay. Yeah. Show me with your left hand what you see. Mimic with your left hand. Like this. Oh. Good. Very good. Oh, man, I don't see it. I just did it. Uh, look at... Oh, I don't see it, I just did it. So, you can begin to think, well, there, there are multiple, I mean, there's, here's, here classically were two mental systems, but maybe there, there are multiple mental systems, and then you think about disruptions to cognition, which the neuropsychologists and behavioral neurologists, and kind of we all know about, are truly astounding. <clears throat> you can get disruptions of space, memory, language of all kinds, and yet, uh, wherever the lesion is, uh, you would never say the person is not conscious. It's kind of like you can't stamp it out uh, in normal cortical lesion kind of systems. You can't stamp consciousness out. And here's an example <laughs> for those of you who don't see clinical patients at all. This is thanks to Nina Drockers, a case of hers of somebody with Wernicke's aphasia. Where'd you go? Up. Oh, there we go. There we are. And today. Yeah, right. <laughs> I imagine it's those that kinds that we have to get the white and black and so forth, which I'm not very good at. Well, we'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how are you feeling today? My end regular mm -hmm. today. Yeah. I terribly, very uncomfortable uh, nug of how I dinated the, my my trackle, actually. Okay, okay. Tell me, have you been here before? Nothing of. Yeah. Have you been here before? Oh, just my wife okay. <laughs> and my kids that have visitors of that, uh -huh. and my children. Uh, so obviously, children that I know within uh, my severely, uh, <coughs> excuse me, disrupted in language, and yet uh, remains conscious. So the the model I want to play with here is that in fact we have all these systems in our head that we all know about, and people study, and, and as I heard Mike Posner say the other day. There's a test to reveal any local area being activated by a specific test. It's all over the place. And the thought is that maybe as they play out, as one pops up in time, they become, uh, through time, 
what we experience as conscious activity and that actually each one of these particular specialties have, it, have its own enabling circuit that allow that skill to have a felt sense. That's what consciousness is, a felt sense of some capacity. And let me just show you how that you can possibly think about this. Now give me a second to set this up because this is an absolutely fascinating thing. Here's case VP, a split brain patient. And we're going to show her a word. <clears throat> and the word's going to be breakfast. Okay? Breakfast. And the way the test is set up, her fixation, she fixates between them in the middle of the word. So the right brain sees the word break and the left brain sees the word fast. You and I would just see it as breakfast, right? But her right brain sees break, her left brain sees fast. <clears throat> she also, this particular patient speaks out of each hemisphere. Okay? So when we show her, show her the word, what is she going to do? Well, what she does is in fact the right brain speaks first. And you'll hear her say, break, like in break. The left brain hears that, and it's got to do fast, right? And so it corrects the right brain. And she says, break, fast. But that's not why I'm saying. So that's just a little sidelight to the tape. What it is is two mental systems just pouring out their stuff through time, and it all seems like a unified conscious experience, but in fact, it's modules expressing themselves through time. So watch it and see what you think. I'm not getting any audio from you. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it, it varies. Well, this will be the last one. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. It used to be <clears throat> 50 years ago. It was the slide and the slide projector jammed. Now we have little laptop failures. Okay, well, we, with this little model to think about, schema to think about, still remaining are the, is the deeper question of this explanatory, what is commonly called the explanatory gap. How do neurons and live cells and that kind of thing turn into mind? And this gap between mind and brain <laughs> is known by all, worried about by all. It's also known by <clears throat> almost anybody in science and physics and, uh, and elsewhere. The thought of figuring out an explanation for how mind generates uh, how brain generates a mind, uh, how neurons generate a mental state uh, is, a, is uh, something that has worried people for years. Uh, John Tyndall, a physicist at the Royal Institution, says the passage from physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable. How are these physical processes connected with the facts of consciousness? The chasm between the two classes of phenomena would still remain intellectually impassable. More recently, the philosopher Joseph Levine, in his book The Purple Haze, said, we have no idea how a physical object could constitute a subject of experience. There seems to be no discernible connection between the physical description and the mental one. So a lot of people just think this isn't possible. And as far as I know, there's absolutely <clears throat> no, nobody that actually knows how it works. But we should be thinking about it. It's an important idea. And it turns out if you dig into the literature and read around in early philosophy and biology and up to the present, there are ideas that I think may help on this problem. And that's really kind of what I'm trying to do in the, in the book that you all get on the way out, I guess. <laughs> so I'm going to call it the Chicago School. And it's when Nicholas Rafshevsky, the great math 
biologist and, and chess master, Michael Polanyi, the great philosopher, Robert Rosen, uh, the great uh, theoretical biologist, and, and Roger Sperry, uh, the great neuroscientist and biologist and, and my mentor. Uh, they all went through the, uh, Chicago. They all touched each other. And they all have this view, which I discovered in the process of writing this, <laughs> that there's something else to figure out here. If we're going to figure this thing out, there's something else. We've got we to get our head around something. And uh, what they plainly put it this way, you've got to set the boundary conditions. So as he put it, a machine as a whole works under the control of two distinct principles. The higher one is the principle of the machine's design, and this harnesses the lower one, which consists in the physical chemical processes on which the machine relies. So you can have all that internal stuff going, but it's in a defined space. And Robert Rosen, who was right there with Polanyi as the theoretical biologist, put it this way, organization must be independent from the material particles which seem, seemingly constitute a living system. Or kind of impishly, he said, <laughs> the human body completely changes the matter it is made of roughly every eight weeks. If science insists on chasing particles, they will follow them right through the organism and miss the organism entirely. So it, you're working in, in a space, and then uh, the, these people, uh, uh, Rosen, Roshevsky, and Polanyi contributed, contributed to what is called a field of relational biology. What are the relationships between the structure, the architecture, the organization, and the physical chemical elements? As they put it, throw away the matter and keep the underlying organization. That, that was this. Now, people know this, but I wouldn't say it's a dominant view or feeling in those uh, uh, of us trying to figure out how the brain does its tricks. So what I want to <laughs> sort of leave you with is uh, describe the work of two current uh, pioneers. One, very elderly now, uh, and it's uh, and my knowing of, of, about Howard Petty came through uh, writing this book. He was a Stanford-trained physicist who went on to theoretical biology, he spent his professional life at the SUNY Binghamton, and wrote over the course of his professional career, he's still writing, 50 or so incredibly lucid papers where he thinks deeply about uh, what he calls the epistemic cut, the cut between inanimate and animate, and takes that all the way up to thinking about how the brain does its tricks. And also, <clears throat> I'll tell you a bit about John Doyle, a, a, a professor of control and dynamical systems at Caltech, who, if you've been reading the literature, is pushing, uh, picking up on this and more <clears throat> about layered systems as how we should think about our problem. So Petit takes you all the way down, all the way back. He wants to know about how inanimate stuff became animate. He was, it's actually a fascinating story. He was sitting at a lecture in Caltech as a high school student, given by Linus Pauling. And Pauling sort of raises this question of Schrodinger's cat and qu the quantum physics, classic physics dilemma. And this young man got this question in, this, in, his, in his head and then spent his life trying to figure it out. Uh, and so he wanted to know, what, well, what do you need to figure out how inanimate stuff goes from here, which follows all the physical chemical principles of the world, and all of a sudden goes over here and becomes life? This is, by the way, a little editorializing here. This is real interdisciplinarity. I mean, I have no business reading this stuff, but you get hooked. And anything that uh, encourages people to, to really experience true interdisciplinarity 
uh, we talk about it all the time, but we rarely do it, uh, is, I think, uh, really, really exciting, and it's fun, too. Anyway, editorial over. Replicability. You have to have replicability. Obviously, if something is going to have life, it's got to be able to repeat, be, be alive. It's going to be able to repeat itself, reproduce itself. In order to do that, it needs coded symbolic information. It needs a set of instructions to tell the system how to build another one. <laughs> and then, as we know from life, it is evolvable. So that sub coded symbolic information can vary in its implementation. And in that variation, you can, of course, have natural selection, work on the variation, and that process go forward. And then finally, there's a complementarity. You have a, uh, a hard-coded system that's somehow instantiated in the physical matter. And then you have a code that is read by those instructions, which then becomes what can be changed uh, in its implementation. So recability and evolvability become the clue for closing the gap. And so let me just say this and, and see if I can make it clear. By the way, this is all hopefully clear in the book. It is evolvable, and to evolve the process has to introduce variation, so natural selection can begin its work, and variation had to come from a code an abstract, reliable representation of the instructions. The substrate of the code is a physical structure, but codes themselves are symbols, and symbols are subjective, follow no physical laws but rules, and there's the trick right there. The gap between non-life and life is bridged by an abstract but physical code, a substance. There is no spook in the system. So Howard Petty's idea, let me restate it, and then we'll go, <clears throat> argues that life is to be seen as a layered system in which each layer has indeed demands its own vocabulary. How do the layers communicate across the epistemic cut? He calls this the, the epistemic cut. The gap, or as the Germans say, the schnitt. I love that. On one side of the schnitt, there is the firing of neurons, on the other, there are symbols, the representations of the physical, that also have a physical reality. Only one side of the Schmidt, Schnitt can be evaluated at a time, though both are real and physical and tangible. And this, then, is Bohr's complementarity idea on a larger scale. So this idea, it's a big idea. It's a way you have to, you, you don't get this and then have a drink. You got to think about it and, and kick it around and roll it around. But it's also part of this whole <laughs> layered idea that bring, brings up my last uh, thing, uh, point about uh, with John Doyle uh, uh, at Caltech. So you think of layers, we all know what layers are. It's common in computer science world, of course. Not so common in biology, but common in the computer science world. Now, just to make it uh, concrete, and, uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but it helps you think about it, is the hard hardware-software distinction. You've got a motherboard in your computer that's useless, uh, and you've got software in your computer that's useless. And unless you put them together, you get a PowerPoint presentation out of the deal. There's two different layers going on there. There's the physical layer and the programming layer. <laughs> Now, understanding what's going on between those two layers to produce the PowerPoint is completely hard. Very little vocabulary on it. And as Doyle says, it is, represents one of the deep scientific problems everywhere. How do layers interact? <laughs> that we have layers, everybody knows you all flew here, this little plane has 150,000 modules and subsystems and 1,000 computers. It used to be this didn't have any computers, and the pilot actually was really fly, manipulating the wires on the wings. The 747 has 1,000 computers in there, and the, the pilot's up there playing with a joystick while flying the plane. 
and it's because of all the layers that are that are allowing for stability, complexity, but also fragility. So, and this is uh, because of my voice. So this system is brought in to, to understand biological system and layered systems in biology, but I'm just going to skip that round, sorry. So, to wind up, is consciousness an instinct? <laughs> well, as William James says, instincts are the functional correlates of structure. A single complex instinctive action may involve successfully the awakening of impulses. So there could be a, a quick instinct, but then something like language, like consciousness. It's just the rattling off of little instincts into uh, a one that looks like something else. Uh, and, and actually, William James made the bold statement, every brain cell has its own individual consciousness, which no other cell knows. Even. I don't go there, but I thought I'd throw it in. Uh, uh. And think, well, you know, okay, well, you know, is there any evidence for this kind of thing? And just, just let me just re refer to this exciting new work where they figure out in Drosophila now that there's 29 specific networks in the brain, each controlling a specific layer. And the authors propose that uh, what more complex behaviors is just a resequencing of these 29 capacities, boop, 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 that way, boop, 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 this way, and so forth. And you get, you get it. So there's an underlying notion that there are specific systems that are reordered through time to produce a behavior. So the bubbling brain, I line myself up with these people. <coughs> William James put it. <coughs> uh, boy. Every impulse and every step of every instinct shines with its own sufficient light and seems at the moment the only eternally right and proper thing to do. It's done for its own sake exclusively. And David Hume, as I said earlier, the mind is kind of a theater where several perceptions successfully make their appearance, pass, repass, glide away, and mingle in the infinite variety of postures and situations. And Sir Charles Sherrington, the great British physiologist, how far is the mind a collection of quasi-independent perceptual minds integrated psychically in large measure by temporal concurrence of experience? Simple contemporaneity. Con Temporality can just join it all. So it's in the book, read it, but <laughs> I should leave you with the one thought of William James. Good humor is a philosophic state of mind. It seems to say to nature that we take her no more seriously than she takes us. I maintain that one should always talk of philosophy and these kinds of issues with a smile. Thank you very much.